see each one of you here this morning. Just greet a few people before you seated, but hold on, let me say this. What I'd like to do is I'd like our moms, both biological and spiritual, to remain standing, and then everybody else sit down. Okay, all of our moms at every campus, at every campus, and moms, if you're at home, online, stand up. All right, look at all these moms. Happy Mother's Day to every one of you. And where are you going? Happy Mother's Day. Listen, I don't know about you ladies, but I was exhausted when I watched that video, weren't you? Oh my goodness, thank you. You may be seated, but I would like to ask my beautiful mom to remain standing. I want to take a few minutes and I just want to honor my mother. She's such a lovely person. Mom, I want to thank you and tell you how much I love you, how precious you are to me. Thank you for raising me in the church. I remember as a little girl, you told me that you dedicated me to the Lord when I was still in your room. And so I've seen evidence of that throughout my life. Thank you. I love you. Now, you did force me to take piano lessons when I was in elementary, but I know it was because her desire was my, uh, my gift to the house, to the Lord, would be to pray for the house of the Lord. So she got her prayer because by junior high school, I was playing for our church our little Baptist church, one Sunday a month. It was Young Adult Sunday. I was a young adult choir director, and I played. And then one of my teachers, who was Methodist, his daughter went to college, and she was one of the church pianists for one Sunday of the Methodist church. So he asked my mom, can your daughter play for us one Sunday of the month? And of course she said, yes. So then I was playing for the Methodist church as well, one Sunday of the month, and I did that until I graduated from high school. So mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. And then I would also like to take a moment and I would like to honor my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law or my mother-in-love, Mamaw Tejada. I love her so much. I'm so grateful to Mamaw. Thank you for raising this wonderful husband for me and for inviting me in your family as your daughter. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. And last but not least, I have all these thank you guys. I never get up here much, so I got to take it advantage of it. I would like to thank my spiritual mom, Pastor Kathy Hayes. And if you've been around Covenant a long time, then she is your spiritual mom as well. And I've told her throughout the years, I said, you know, Pastor Kathy, your wisdom and grace has just been a, a constant example for me. And you've blessed me in so many ways. And that holds true for, the, for today as well and this season of my life. So I love you, Pastor Kathy. Happy Mother's Day to you. And then I would like to thank my husband. Honey, thank you for this opportunity to share today and for not allowing me to back out of it. Yeah. Amen. All right. So I would like to welcome all of the campuses. Carrollton, thank you for being here. Help me welcome Colleyville, Crossroads, McKinney, our online campus. Thank you for joining us today. This is a great day to be alive, and I am so honored to be with you today and to share I got to get things all ready. See, Jeremy asked me if I wanted his help, and I said, no, it's okay. I got it. I got it. Okay, so let's get started. Years ago in my corporate career as a systems design engineer on the F-16 fighter jet, the Air Force asked us to design a situational awareness display to put the God's, a God's eye view to display for the pilot with reference to threats that he was about to encounter. So this, this display would let him see his current aircraft position relative to threats he was about to encounter. Now, it also had wingman information and other information as well. And then they wanted us to present this design to the cockpit review team, which consisted of fighter pilots who uh, came from all around the world, and they represent all of the other Air Force fighter pilots that were stationed at bases. And they would come in, I don't know if that made sense, but that's okay. And so we would present the latest and greatest capabilities, and they would vote on all the ones they wanted in the next big software upgrade on the fighter jets out in the field. And so we designed this God's eye view display that they wanted. We put it on what's called a multifunction display set, which is a pair of displays considered heads down. You have the HUD, the head up display, you have the upfront controls, and then you had the heads down, the multifunction display. Now, the concern with this design was that it would become a distraction for the pilots because they would constantly have to look down to access this information because you know they want to access this information quite a bit. What if... What if God gave each one of us the ability 
real time as we're walking throughout our lives to access information about threats we we're about to encounter or problems we were about to encounter, wouldn't we be a little distracted or even obsessed? Come on, obsessed because we would constantly be looking. Okay, what problems do I need to avoid today? Oh my gosh, I'm going to try to avoid every single problem. I can only speak for myself. I would try to avoid every single problem. There's not one problem that I would say, yes, I can go through that today. But isn't it true that some negative experience are meant to be a part of our journey in us becoming who God has called us to be because it's in the becoming that growth and maturity happens. And Jesus was the only one, 100% God, 100% man. He had full disclosure of threats he was not only going to encounter, but threats that were going to destroy his life. But he didn't look to the left or the right. He didn't try to avoid them. He walked the straight path right to the cross just for you and me, and we are so undeserving. God has uniquely created each one of us for his pleasure, and he has a perspective of what he wants each of our lives to accomplish. And I don't know about you, but I want, I want God's perspective for my life. I want his wisdom and his insight. I don't want to just decide, you know what? I want to do this. I like to do that. I have a gift for this. I think I'll do this. No, I want God. I want your purposes and plans for my life. Lead me and guide me. I want your perspective. Do you feel that way? Well, great. All right. One person feels that way. No. <laughs> Well, the title of my message today is God's Eye View, the only perspective that really matters. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this message that you've given me today. Lord, I thank you for clarity of thought, clarity of speech, that you would anoint my words, that you would anoint everyone's ears to hear and their hearts to receive what you are saying, because you are the voice of many waters, and you can tailor make whatever I say to be exactly what you need that person to hear. So I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the scripture focus for today is found in Matthew 17. You can turn with me there, or you can look at the big Bible in the sky, as we're all, I would say, guilty of doing. But I, for the ladies, for the moms today, I gave you a bookmark, and I hope you enjoy it. I love tulips, and tulips have such a short season. I wanted you to have tulips all year round. And then some of you may be thinking, that bookmark is so archaic. We read everything on the computer. Well, I want to encourage you to come back to the books where you hold them in your hand. You flip through the pages. I have my Bible next to my bed. I don't have it here. Okay, please forgive me. But I have it next to my bed, and I love having books I can flip through the pages, Okay. So Matthew 17, one through eight, let's read. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered or exclaimed and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles as a memorial, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Wow, can you imagine being there to witness this vision? It was incredible. And the Lord gave some advice that day that was timeless because it was true then and it holds true for today. So we're gonna get our three points from that, but there's a lot right here in this passage that we just read, and I'm gonna just pick it apart, and we're gonna start right at the beginning. It starts with after six days. So I wanna tell you what was going on just six days before. Jesus and the disciples had been on a tour of Caesarea Philippi in Galilee, and the disciples saw Jesus do some amazing things. They saw people getting healed and delivered, and it was incredible. But then he started to have with them what I call 
crucial conversations. And one of them, Pastor Ricky talked about a few weeks ago, and this one was okay, but it kind of went a little down here from there. But he said, "Um, guys, who do men say that I am? And several of them chimed in. Oh, some say John the Baptist. Some say um, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Some say Elijah. Then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus, in a profound moment, not Jesus, but Peter, in a profound moment, because he had these moments where he would open mouth and insert foot, but this was profound. profound. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, very good, Peter. The only way you know that is because my father revealed it to you. But then he went on talking about all of these terrible things that were gonna happen to him when he went to Jerusalem and how he was gonna be tortured and he was gonna be killed. And so the, the disciples were confused because they had a perspective about why Jesus had come. That he had come, he was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. They had been hearing about the Messiah and they were gonna rule with him. But what he was saying didn't make sense to them. And you know they had to be talking among themselves saying, does anybody know what he's talking about? I don't know. So they had a perspective of what they thought of why Jesus had come. So let's go on to verse one, continue. It says this, Jesus Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brother, led them up on a high mountain. Now this was our first indication that God was about to elevate their perspective because God had used mountains throughout scripture to elevate man's perspective and his understanding. It was on a mountain where God gave Moses the 10 commandments. It was on a mountain where God gave Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And then it was on a mountain where he told Elijah to go and meet up on, up on the mountain. So Elijah goes up there and the, and the scripture says this in 1 Kings 19, I love it. It says, and God passed by and then there was a windstorm, but the Lord was not in the wind. And then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was fire but the Lord was not in the fire. And then it says, and Elijah heard a still small voice. So then he came from the back of the cave where he had backed up when all the drama started happening. And it says, he came to the mouth of the cave. He wrapped his face in a cloak and he stood before God. And so God began to talk with him. See, God is in the business of elevating our perspective and our understanding because if he didn't do this, our natural inclination would be to operate in our limited human perspective. And that is not good for anybody in most cases, right? Okay, so let's move on. It says, Jesus was transfigured before them in verse two. So here they are, they are witnessing this this vision where heaven is intersecting earth. And Peter had just had the spiritual revelation days before of who Jesus was. But now God is giving them a visual confirmation of who he is because Jesus' face is shining like the sun, his clothes white like light. You see, God needed these three, Peter, James, and John, he needed them to truly understand who Jesus was because of the upcoming days about what they were about to go through. They were the leaders among the disciples and he needed them to lead because it was gonna get pretty rough, okay? So here they were seeing Jesus more than just a man. Jesus is, he is who he says he is and who God revealed to us. So then he goes on in verse three and it says this, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking to him. Now this is where it went downhill for Peter because I think he got starstruck. I think he was like, whoa, man, wow, that's amazing with Jesus, but this is Moses, the famous Moses, man. I mean, he didn't say it, but he had to be thinking because of what he did next. This is Moses who, who God gave the 10 commandments to. This is Moses who parted the Red Sea. This is Moses who led our people out of bondage. And that's Elijah. He is the one who called down fire from heaven. And God said, chariots of fire pulled by horses of fire and took them in a whirlwind into heaven. 
I mean, he got so caught up in whatever he was thinking that he did the unthinkable. He stepped forward and he spoke, open mouth and serve for Jesus. It's so cool that we're here today. If you want, we could build a tabernacle for, as a memorial, one for you, one for you, and one for you. All right? And then I love this because look, it says, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. It was like God's like, whoo, I am not going to listen to where he's going with this. And God just interrupted. He said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. God was like, really, Peter? Really, just go with me. I know I'm taking a little license, but all right, it's, it's all in scripture. God's like, really, Peter, I just revealed to you days ago who my son is. I just gave you a visual confirmation today. And here you are in your limited human perspective. You're just trying to make him even with everybody else. No one deserves that place of honor and worship in your life equal to my son, Jesus. And I need you to understand that. So this brings me to our first point, and I asked him to leave it up because I don't have those cute little short points. It's a long sentence, but this is what it is. Don't get distracted with your own perspective and plans, but focus only on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't get distracted with your own perspective and plans, but focus only on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when we focus on Jesus, when we put him in his rightful place and we ask him to give us his insight, give us understanding, he will not only give us that, but he will give us tailor-made plans just for our situation. Let me tell you, don't you think for one minute that you have a clear understanding of your situation. You can't read people's minds. You don't know what's in their hearts. You don't know the future. You don't know where you fit where your little life fits into the big scheme of what's going on right now. But we serve a God who knows it all. And he is willing to reveal to us whatever he wants us to see if we ask him. But we have to start by putting him in his rightful place in our lives. God always tries to elevate our understanding and our perspective. Now here's another example of Peter getting caught in his limited human perspective is, remember I said the crucial conversation, Jesus talking about his death, everything that was gonna happen. Well, Peter had the nerve to pull him to the side and chastise him about that. And then Jesus had to turn and put him in his place. Let's read that, because I want you to see something. Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23 says this, but Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. And listen what he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Now, let me tell you, we know that, that Peter did this because he loved him. You guys, oh, poor Peter. Come on, he loved you, Jesus. Why were you so harsh? Well, this is what I want you to understand. Why was the human point of view such a big problem for Jesus in that moment? I believe that Jesus had moments where his humanity tried to take leverage over his divinity, he struggled. You know, while he was telling them about, I'm going to be, I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be um, tortured. I'm going to be killed. That had to be hard because he was hundred percent God. He was hundred percent man. In case you're thinking I'm taking a little too much license. Remember in the garden when he prayed and he was sweating and his sweat was like big drops of blood and in agony. He said, God, if there's any way for this cup to pass for me, let it pass. But then he resolved and he said, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That showed us there. That wasn't the only time he struggled with it. So in that moment, while he's telling the disciples, guys, we've been on a tour, things have been great, but we're about to go to Jerusalem and it's not gonna look pretty. I'm trying to prepare you guys. And they were confused and they didn't understand. So Peter's speaking up in that moment. He was like, he wasn't calling him Satan. He was like, you're allowing Satan to use you to be a stumbling block for me. That's why he said, you're a dangerous trap. Stop, this is not the time. I am telling you, this is the path that I must walk. Now, maybe you're here and you're thinking you're a Peter sympathizer because you're like, you're too hard on Peter. I don't like this. I'm not listening to anything else she's saying because Peter's my favorite disciple and you have just been beating him down. But I want to say something. Peter represents us all and our default position 
to operate out of our feelings and our pain and our anger, our emotion. He represents all of us, so I can pick on him because I pick on him, I'm picking on us. And the, where we always start, we're all, God's got to remind us. So don't be distracted with your own perspective and plans, but focus only on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered what they were talking about, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? Well, Luke, in Luke's version of this account, he tells us they were talking about what Jesus was about to go through in Jerusalem and how his exodus from this world. So maybe they were encouraging him. Maybe they were saying, hey, I know you can do this, Jesus. You can do this. We're with you. But have you ever wondered why it was Moses and Elijah who were chosen to speak to Jesus in this vision? Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. Didn't the law and the prophets always point to Christ? So in that moment, it was an intersection, the law, the prophets, and the Messiah, whom they had pointed to all along and wanted people to wait for. Okay, let's move on to verse 5. <clears throat> so verse 5, so God moves in, this is my son, and whom I'm well pleased. And then he says this, hear him. So this is point number two, very straightforward. Let the voice of Christ be the prevailing voice in your life. Listen, there are so many voices in our lives. From the minute we wake up in the morning to we'll go to bed at night, we have family, we have friends, we have our favorite news source, we have newspapers, articles, we have all kinds of things. We have a lot of voices. But I submit to you that we have the big three, the big three that every other voice stems from. You might not agree with me, but this is, you're like, big three? Wait a minute. So the first one is this, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that wasn't the three. That was three and one. That was one voice. And so we hear God speaks to us through his word when we read it, when we hear the teaching of his word, when uh, he speaks through people, he speaks through circumstances. Hey, there's no limit. He even speaks through a donkey back in the Old Testament. But that's a whole other story. You can't limit him. He can speak however he wants. But then you have the enemy, you have Satan. Remember Jesus just mentioned how Peter, the enemy was using Satan. The enemy would try to mimic what God does. So he uses people. And sometimes people that we love will say things hurtful. Maybe a mother or father has said something like, you will never amount to anything. You don't ever get anything right. And you've got to forgive them. Ask God's help to forgive them because they're not meaning to beat you down. But sometimes our limited human perspective, the enemy kind of gets in there and just uses things. So we have to remember this, who God is. Now, this is the third voice, and this is the one I think has the most influence and really the most power over all of us, and it's our own voice. This is why, because we can choose what voice we want to hear. We can choose what we want to believe to be true, but make, make no mistake that whatever you choose to believe becomes a part of your belief system. And what you believe to be true, you start to act out. You start to speak and, and act accordingly based upon what you believe to be true. So we have to be careful of what we allow to get in, get in our hearts. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life, the direction that you're going to go. It takes a lot of effort to guard our hearts. And listen, if you take something that the enemy has spoken through someone, a negative thing that's a lie, and you believe it to be true, you're going to act out on it. You're going to self-sabotage, and you won't even know you're doing it. I had a situation like that. So years ago, one of the most intimidating things I've ever done in my life, besides what I'm doing right now, I've been up since two this morning, is <laughs> was to stand before that room of fighter pilots as the system design lead of the incorporation of three, three brand new weapons on the fighter jet. I had 80 something charts to present to them and I talked about all about each one of the weapons and then I presented to them the design that we created for them to use on the F-16. That was amazing. Oh my gosh, it was terrifying. I did a lot of praying and crying before I got to that point. But then I had to walk forward with such confidence like I knew what I was here for. But anyway, <laughs> okay, so anyway, but the path I was on early on in my career as an engineer, the trajectory was not leading me to that moment, that opportunity. So how did I get there? So the first couple of years, 
I worked hard and I think I did a good job. You know, I was considered a little above average engineer um, and my performance appraisal confirmed it because when I would get my performance appraisal in the middle, I went and looked, I actually still kept my performance appraisal, I was told. But anyway, I looked at it and in the center it says needs improvement. To the left it says meets expectations and all the way to the left it's like exceeds. Well, I was stuck on meets. I just got the job done for several years and I was like, God, Lord, Lord, I know I can do better, Lord, and I just don't know what's going on. I feel like I've hit the ceiling. I just can't get past it. I mean, even in my understanding, because you can imagine how many technical things, it was, it was hard. Every time I went there, I mean, you had to be on your game. Like everything was so technical and detail-oriented. And so and I was like, God, help me. Help me, Lord. And I remember one of those times I cried out and I said, God, what's wrong with me? And at that moment, God took me back to an encounter I had the third week after I started working with the company. And there was another girl. She had graduated a few years before me, and she had been working at the company. She had graduated with a mechanical engineering degree, and mine was electrical. And she happened to be a black female because that's important to the story. So I wait the third week. I go over, and I'm so excited to see a familiar face from school. And I give her a hug. And one of the first words out of her mouth, or the first words were, said black people won't get anywhere in this company. And it was like a slap in the face, but I, did, I just listened and I walked away and I didn't talk to anybody about the conversation. I didn't think that I was meditating on it at all, but the Holy Spirit said to me when he took me back to that encounter and when I remember what she said, he said, you believed her over me. And I was like, oh my gosh. God, I didn't even think I even remembered that encounter. But then I realized that because I believed, I took to heart what she said. And I believe no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get past a certain point. And so I said, God, forgive me. I was self-sabotaging and I didn't even know it. And so I don't know what limiting words have been spoken over you or what limiting thoughts you've been operating under and you feel stuck and you can't break through. And I'm asking you right now to allow Jesus' voice to be the prevailing voice in your life. You need to ask God to give you his perspective about your situation. If you can't break through, say, God, I feel stuck. Show me, is there something I'm not seeing in this picture? Help me to see it. And I promise you, he will show you. I would have had no clue if I hadn't wanted to get exceeds. It might sound selfish, but I wanted to give my very best. I wanted exceeds. I didn't want to just meet expectations. And so I'm going to tell you, okay, I just started in that moment. I said, God, forgive me. I thank you. I know that I can do all things through you who gives me the strength. I know that I'm your daughter, and I know I, I know no weapons formed against me will prosper. I mean, I just started using the word. And I was encouraging myself and the Lord like David did when his mighty men turned on him for a little bit. So we have to do that. We have to remind ourselves who we are. I'm a son of the living God. I'm a daughter of the living God. We tell our sons all the time. We tell them, I said, don't forget who you are. Remember who you are. And I'm talking about the son of the living God. Don't, let me say this. Do not, we should never focus on the things that appear to put us at a disadvantage because we will never reach our maximum potential. Never, ever, don't you focus on whatever you think puts you at a disadvantage. Maybe somebody told you, you're too big, you're too small, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too whatever. You're not smart enough, you're too smart. I don't know what it is. You're not you're of the right pedigree. I don't know what you've been told, but you have got to rise above it. Stinking thinking helps you walk out a self-fulfilling prophecy. You begin to sabotage yourself without realizing it like I was. But doing the opposite, meditating on the promises of God, declaring his word, it helps us to walk out our God-given prophetic purpose. So you get some scriptures for you to stand on and start declaring them and see what God's going to do in your life. Because the end of the story, because I don't want to forget this, as you know, I got to have that opportunity, but things changed for me. It turned around, but it started here and here.
And when I realized who I was and I could do whatever God empowered me to do. And then I got the opportunity. We heard the design engineers heard about these brand new weapons. And I got, long story short, I have to tell you the details another time, but I got the opportunity to do it. And guess what? My performance appraisal was exceeds after that for the work I did on it. And it stayed on exceeds till I left the company. I have a copy of that too. And then also I received a letter from the Air Force, a letter of appreciation. And actually, they mentioned five engineers. But then another paragraph said, we'd like to especially thank Ms. Sid Patton. So the other guys were all excited about the letter, but then they're like, oh, that's your letter. And so my boss was so proud, he put it in a company newspaper. I hope I'm not sounding like I'm bragging. I just want you to see how God can turn things around. And then I received a raise and a promotion. This is my story, only I can tell. And so I want to share it with you to encourage you for wherever you are. So let's move on to verse six. That was point number two. Let Jesus' voice be the prevailing voice in your life. Okay, so verse six. Remember we said, but suddenly God came in that cloud, right? So he spoke, and then it says, but when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and they were greatly afraid. Now listen, I'm not picking on Peter or nobody because if we were all there and that happened to us where we're looking at this wonderful vision and then all of a sudden a cloud, we're surrounded by this bright cloud and a voice booms, we would have all fallen flat on our faces. But here's the thing, is that fear is our first response when the suddenlies come in our lives or when things we don't understand happen or the unknown happens. Fear is our first response, but that's not the problem. The problem is when fear remains. Verse seven says this, but Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and do not be afraid. Now, in that moment, I I know you're saying, well, he was just talking to them by getting up right then, but no, he was speaking to something much deeper in them. Because of all the things he was saying about what was going to happen to him, you know they had to wonder if they were following them, what's going to happen to us? And then Jesus went on and he would say, and if you're going to follow after me, you need to take up your cross and follow me. And whoever tries to save your life will lose it. You know the guys had been talking among themselves. What is he talking about? We didn't sign up for this, man. But, but we're with you, Jesus. But you know they were afraid. And they were like, but God, we're with you. But they're like, does he mean literal? Does he mean figuratively? What is he talking about? They still didn't really, really understand. So Jesus was saying to them, when he touched them, he was like, listen, you three... You're the leaders among my disciples. You're going to have to arise and not be afraid. I need you to lead the rest of them because things are going to happen. It's going to be hot and heavy, and it's going to be hard. So verse 8 says, when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So point number three is this. We must fix our eyes on Jesus only and choose to arise out of the place of fear and doubt. When they saw Jesus only, it gave them the strength to stand. Because if fear remains, fear of what others think, fear about the future, fear of whatever, what we've allowed ourselves to believe about ourselves, you know what it does? Fear paralyzes. It paralyzes us, but not just that, it blinds us to truth because all we can see is the lie that we've been believing. So when fear remains, it can lead to discouragement, severe discouragement and, and depression. It can lead to hopelessness and despair. It can lead to us being stuck in the old limiting mindsets, being living life through our anger and our fears and our offenses and whatever. We could be stuck in our self-devised plans and strategies if fear remains. But remember what verse eight says, when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. So they arose from their place of fear. So I'm asking you today to look up from your place of fear and doubt. Trust that God has got you. He's gonna lead you. He's gonna guide you. He's gonna take care of you. I promise you. But then look up from your place of depression. Find somebody else who is worse off than you and go and serve and help someone else. Get the focus from you only. I want you to look up from your place of 
being stuck in the limiting mindsets. Don't be stuck. Look up. See no one but Jesus only. Fix your eyes on him. Then you will have the strength to arise. Whatever your situation is, listen, the odds seem to be stacked against you. Maybe it's in your family life, your professional life, your personal life. I don't know what it is. Or maybe you've received a medical diagnosis that seems insurmountable. There's nothing too big for him. And we're going to fight for the truth of what God wants us to see. And these three points I just gave you, we got to fight for those every single day. Sometimes depending upon your makeup several times a day. Number one, don't get distracted with your own perspective and plans, but focus only on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he will give us his wisdom, his insight. He will give us um, solution for our problem. He will give us tailor-made plans, like we said, just for our situations. You would have never gotten that on your own. Number two, let the voice of Christ be the prevailing voice in your life. And number three, we must fix our eyes on Jesus only and choose to arise out of the place of fear and doubt. These are the choices we have to make every single day. Excuse me. If we purpose in our hearts to please Jesus in everything we do, then we will do everything with excellence. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. When we focus on acknowledging who he really is, then we discover who we are and who we are supposed to be. Because Jesus rose out of that grave, guess what? We can arise out of grave mentality, grave understanding, grave living, grave perspective. We need to ask God about this race situation and what's going on and all this fighting that's going on. We need to get his perspective. Stop operating out of your anger and your frustration and whatever it is. Listen, life is hard enough. We need to help each other stand. We need to link arms together and fight together. We need to encourage, encourage one another. We don't have time for all of that crazy stuff. And we as the sons and daughters of God, we have to live differently. We don't have to be like the world. Across the world, the body of Christ needs to link arms and stand. Are you willing to stand? Yes, you can stand with me today. We're trusting God for who he is and what he's doing. When we allow Jesus to elevate our perspective and understanding, then we are allowing him to elevate us. God's eye view is the only perspective that really matters. Let's pray, come on. Thank you, Lord. Oh God, we thank you this morning. Father, you gave me this message. When you led me to the scripture at first, I had no clue, I didn't see anything there. But Lord, you knew what you wanted to say today. And I thank you that you're doing surgery in the hearts and minds of your people. And Lord, for anybody that feels stuck, that feels discouraged, Lord, because they've been operating in the limited human mindsets. I thank you that you would set them free right now in the name of Jesus, that you would reveal the thing that caused them to be stuck. I thank you for liberty for every person here in the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Amen. Now, if you would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to speak to some of you here today because maybe as I was speaking, you were here and you said, you know, I don't feel like I can honestly say that I'm a son or a daughter of the living God. I don't feel like I have that kind of, of relationship with him. And if you're here today, then the Holy Spirit, you feel a little like I need to, I need to act out on this. Then I want to ask you to lift your hand. Or maybe you might be that person that you're saying, I have accepted Jesus, but I know that the way I've lived my life, I have not made the best decisions. And I can't, if people looked at me, they would, they would think that I wasn't a son or daughter of the living God. So you're here today. Don't pass up the opportunity to lift up your hand and say, Jesus, I want to accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. Is there anyone here today? I see hands. Come on, raise up your hand. If you're here today and you say, I want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life, 
you're here and you say, I want to return back to Christ. I see this hand. Do we have any more hands? Also, at the other campuses, if you're there, lift up your hand. And also online, there's a little button that says, I'm lifting up my hands. Right now, don't pass this opportunity because Jesus said, if you be ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father who's in heaven. Do you know that tomorrow is not promised to any of us? So we have to take every opportunity that we have. Let me see your hands raised high all over this place. Those who want to accept Jesus as Lord, amen. I see your hands back there. Thank you, Lord, at every campus, raise your hands. Thank you, Father. Well, this is what I want to do. I want to take it a step further. And I want to say to you, I remember the time when I raised up my hand to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. I grew up in the church, but I didn't really get saved till I was a freshman in college. And so um, I remember that day. So I want to ask you, you've raised your hand. I want to ask you to not be shy. The, our team is going to sing for a little bit. I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and come on here and walk down to the altar. Maybe you didn't even raise your hand, but you know you're supposed to come. I promise you, as you begin to walk, you will start to feel liberated. As I walked down that aisle, at first I was kind of afraid, but when I took a few steps, I felt liberated. Yes, this is my moment. This is my time. I'm not going to pass it up. So I want to invite you to step out of your seats and come down to the altar today as we sing. Thank you. Congratulations to each one of you. Which one of you? God bless you. Thank you so much for responding to God's call today. We prayed for you before this day. We prayed for you. This is your appointed time. There's nothing more important than you could have done today. And I want to ask you to just repeat after me. Because the, the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and confess the Lord Jesus and believe that he raised Christ from the dead, you're saved. It's as simple as that. So I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer with me and all of you as well. Dear Jesus, I love you so much. I need you, Lord. Thank you for this moment. Please cleanse me of all sin and unrighteousness. Please forgive me for everything that I've done, Lord. I surrender to you right now. I give my heart and my life to you. Have your way in me. Jesus, I believe who you are. I know you gave your life for me from, and you rose from the dead for me. And I'm grateful in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. Congratulations. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Now we have some team members right behind you. And if it's okay, we actually have a little gift for Bible for you, if you would like it, an easy to read Bible. And we just wanna get some information because we have, we have info we wanna give you to help you on this new walk that you have uh, decided on. We wanna come alongside you as your sisters and brothers in God. So thank you for responding to this call. Go and tell someone else that you made this decision today. Go and let the world know, because you let us all here. This is your great big family. So God bless each one of you. We love you and thank you. Crazy, thank you. Oh, our team's right here to the left, okay. To your left and my right. Thank you, amen.
What else do I do? Okay, I'm turning this over. <laughs> I did my part. I'm passing it to you. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. And listen, if you made that decision and you didn't make your way down, we want to take this opportunity to still walk alongside of you. So you can text these words, I am saved, to the number 41411, and we will get some material in your hand to walk you along that next that decision that you made as well. If you did not make your way down, you can also do that online. Let me bless you out of here, and make sure you take your mom to lunch. Make sure you celebrate your mom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his name, Jesus. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.